I am a little entertained this morning by how many of our stories involve people passing through locked doors. You heard about Jesus doing this twice in St. John's story, but what you didn't hear was that it also happens in the Acts story. Prior to this trial we hear about today, the chief priest had the apostles arrested and thrown in jail. And during the night, an angel came and let them out, telling them to go preach in the temple. And the next day, the temple guards came to collect the prisoners and bring them before the council, and they found the jail locked up tight, the guards on duty, but no one inside. I got to thinking, there's two other stories that I know of in Acts in which people miraculously are released from prison. Peter is in prison awaiting trial before Herod in Acts chapter 12, and an angel comes and lets him out. And Paul and Silas are released by an earthquake in the 16th chapter of Acts. I made a comment at the Wednesday text study about how I'm sensing a theme here, that maybe this message is not one that can be contained by locked doors, at which somebody said that they were very good at containing the message of Jesus. We had a good laugh, and then that got us talking about evangelism. And as I listened during our discussion, I noticed that when it comes to evangelism, there are a few fears that I hear come to the surface again and again. One is the fear that we will be mistaken for one of those Christians, whatever that might mean. Another is the fear of conflict. We don't like to be confrontational. There's also a fear I heard about hurting others people, other people's feelings, not wanting to seem judgmental. And as I listen to those, it makes me wonder if maybe there's something wrong with what we've been taught about what evangelism is. It seems like we all kind of assume that evangelism is inherently about making a judgment that another person is deficient in some way, that there's something's missing from their life, or that they, have, they believe the wrong thing, and then trying to fix that deficiency. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not at all what I hear in the stories today. The apostles don't go straight from jail to preach in the temple because they need to save these poor, wretched sinners, or because they feel the unbearable weight of being so correct all the time. They seem to have found something, maybe something deep within themselves, they just can't sit on any longer. They enjoy sharing it. And the people around them, even if they aren't believers, enjoy them sharing it. Earlier in the story, it talks about how the folks would bring people out in the streets to lay people, uh, sick people, on their stretchers in the streets so that Peter's shadow might fall on them as they passed by. This is something that is mutually uplifting for everybody. I also noticed that the disciples in that house don't kick Thomas out for being wrong. They continue to gather with him, perhaps because they love him just as Jesus does. So I start to wonder if the real reason we don't enjoy talking about our faith, sometimes even to other members of our own congregation, is that it makes us feel vulnerable. Faith is something very personal. Maybe we're afraid of what people might think about us if we share that part of ourselves. Maybe we're afraid of being rejected ourselves. I know that's true for me. And so I noticed something else in this story. The apostles don't seem to show any fear. There's that first story in John where they're all locked in the house, right? They're fearful then, but after that, the fear seems to disappear. They're all too happy to go straight back to the temple, right where they know they will be found, and continue doing exactly what got them in trouble in the first place. And even in John's story, when, John, when Thomas refuses to believe his friend's incredible story, he continues to gather with them for the rest of the week. When that next Sunday comes, he is there among them. They have not rejected him. They have not retained his sins. And he has not rejected them. Nobody wants to feel rejected. But as I think today about how we try to protect ourselves from that, I can't help but wonder just what it is we're trying to protect. Thomas Merton suggests that the sense of self that I am so concerned with protecting is my own creation, 
a carefully curated construction. He calls it a smoke self, that it's not really a person at all, just the image of one. God doesn't know that person, he says, because God didn't create him. I did. But underneath that ephemeral self, deep at the core of who I really am, is God's image. This deepest self is who God has created. And that's the self that is one with God. From what I read today, I think this might be the truth that the apostles have come to understand. And I think maybe that's why they can be so fearless. It isn't that they have no regard for the reputation or their safety. They just know that those things are smoke. Having been shown who they really are, who they are in God, they are unafraid to let whatever breeze may come blow that smoke away and to reveal the light shining underneath it. It's a far cry from they were locked by themselves in that house for fear of the authorities, isn't it? Now, I wish that I could say that as I have become aware of this truth and begun to experience it in my own life, that I've become less afraid, but so far that is not really the case. I'm still concerned about what other people think about me. I still worry about whether I'm doing enough as a pastor. I still find it uncomfortable to talk about religion with people outside of this community. But at the same time, I also don't feel that my worth as a Christian or that my salvation hangs on those things. I do, however, believe that sharing good news can be done in a way that is mutually life-giving, with or without anyone having a quote-unquote conversion experience. I'd love to be able to have a conversation with someone in which I can share my experience and listen to theirs in a way that leaves us both feeling affirmed in our own faiths, even if those faiths are different. I relish the thought of learning how I might grow in my faith from a Muslim or a Buddhist, or even an atheist, and helping them grow in their faith by sharing my story. And yet I still feel uneasy even asking people in my own congregation about something as simple as their Lenten practices. I'd like to think, and I hope, that I am growing in that way. I'm getting more comfortable claiming my faults and my mistakes without feeling ashamed of them or counting them against my worth. I'm getting more and more able to see the light shining through the smoke, as it were, to separate the things I have done or not done from the person that I am, the person that God made. I'm slowly learning to trust who God made me to be, apart from who I wish I were or who I think I should try to be. And that's an important distinction. Sometimes I think we tell or hear these stories as if they were prescriptive, as though they tell us who we should be or what we ought to do. But as I listen to them today, I don't hear that. I don't hear a goal for which I should be aiming. Instead, I hear a promise, a reassurance that I have been given the power to forgive those sins to keep moving in that direction. The stories offer a vision of what faith can do for us, what it can offer, that it can bring us life that isn't constrained by fear, kept locked in a prison or shut out of the room where everyone else is. I've come to believe that this is the real good news. Not that believing the right thing will earn you a place in heaven, but that God offers us something in Jesus' story that can help us leave behind this existence of constantly trying to protect ourselves and worry what God or anyone else thinks of us, and that that something is the truth of who we are in God. It is the truth that allows us to give up binding ourselves and others by the sins that we've committed or the the mistakes we've made. It is the truth that, as Jesus says, can set us free. 
Even if I am never able to let go of that fear entirely, the stories show me that it is possible. In fact, it's more than possible. They testify to the truth that this freedom is what awaits all of us because God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and everything in between. Here in the middle, we're all still struggling with fear, wrestling with doubt, but God is in that struggling and that wrestling too. Even in my fear, the stories remind me that I don't have to fear. The door may be locked, but that doesn't mean there isn't a way out or a way in.